11 p.m. Uh, talk. <laughs> 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 All right, yeah, Av Avi doesn't remember <laughs> yeah, yeah, how yeah, I would come to talks here. when I was here, so <laughs> I would bring a blanket. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, so uh, yeah, so I'll talk today about, about cover times, blanket times, and majorizing measures. This is joint work with uh, Jian Ding, who's a, who's a probability student at UC Berkeley, who's, who's also, by the way, I guess graduating in the upcoming year. Uh, and Yuval Paris, who of course was a professor at UC Berkeley and is now the manager of the theory group at Microsoft Research. Um, okay, so, so let me get started. Today the talk will be about random walks on graphs, so I hope everybody knows what it is, but uh, everything will just be, you have a simple graph and we'll consider the random process, which is just a simple random walk. Take some, take some starting node and then choose a uniformly random neighbor and then choose a uniformly random neighbor and then choose a uniformly random neighbor and so on. So this is the random process we'll be considering for the entire talk. And uh, I'll just say, even though the, the whole talk will be just be about simple graphs, I'll say that sort of, as you know, I mean, this is well known, if you, if you, you, if you put conductances on the edges here, of course, you can get any, any finite state reversible Markov chain. And all the results I, I state will, will be for any finite state reversible Markov chain. But I'll just focus on simple graphs for the talk. Uh, OK, so, so this is the process uh, we're going to consider. And so let me tell you some, some parameters of Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I mean, not, well, it's not the same, but it's the no, it's re it's reversible. It's a uh, it's it's not a symmetric matrix. Uh, it's not a regular graph. It's not a regular graph. It's an arbitrary simple graph. So let's, it doesn't have to be. It will be reversible, but not symmetric. Yeah, it's undirected. So it's reversible, but it's not symmetric. Yeah. Uh, okay, so here are some sort of classical parameters. One is the hitting time. So what's the hitting time? If you start the random walk at u, what's the expected number of steps before you hit v? This is the hitting time from u to v. And then with the hitting time, we can define the commute time, which is just the symmetrized version here. The commute time from u to v is the hitting time from u to v plus hitting time from v to u. So it's symmetric, and it's, it's not difficult to see that the commute time is also symmetric. So it, satis it satisfies the triangle inequality. Uh, because if you want to I mean, commute from here to here and back, then it's, you can, you can you know, at least you know, hit here, hit here, hit here, and then hit here. So, and if you, if you check, so this gives you the triangle inequality for the commute time. This will be very important for us because this, this metric is going to endow our graph with some geometry that's going to be important for most of the talk. Okay, so that's the commute time. And then actually the main parameter that I'm going to, I'm going to study here is the cover time of the graph. So the, the cover time is just the following. You start a random walk and you wait until the graph is covered. So you look, the cover time is the expected number of steps before the graph is covered. Okay, so it's the expected number of steps before the random walk covers the graph. And of course now there is a choice of starting vertex. Generally, the cover time is de as defined as, the, as, as you start from the worst vertex. So you start from the vertex which maximizes the expected amount of time to cover the graph. And this is the cover time. Okay. Yeah? Uh, no, so it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's not correlated very strongly. Because it, it depends a lot on the topology. So for instance, if I put, if I put you know, 100 paths of the same length between two vertices, the metric will not change. But actually, the but actually the the commute time can uh, can you know sort of can increase or two clicks connected by an edge or, or, or two key cl clicks connected by an edge or I mean sort of a number of uh, in in other in general no the the because the, the geometry you can change the topology of a graph a lot without changing the geometry for instance but but the but this is this this actually sort of is is, is much more sensitive on the topology so it's it's much more so I'll I'll, I'll give a, a different characterization of this but. Uh, but it depends, for instance, on things like connectivity. And, con and, and of course, the shortest path structure of a graph, you can always, you could, you, could, you could make the graph sort of like singly connected and still maintain the shortest path structure. I mean, it's the distance structure, but, the, but somehow the connectivity could change a lot. So it, they're, in general, they're very, very different. Okay? And, uh, uh, right. Okay, so th this is the parameter I care about. So, so let me just mention, I mean, this parameter has been studied uh, for well over 30 years. Here are, some, here are sort of some examples and some sort of, some orders of magnitude of various cover times. So for instance, if I take the path on n nodes and the cover time is, is n squared, already for the complete graph, I mean, this is already, I mean, this is non-trivial as well, but already for the complete graph, uh, you get something interesting going on. In the, in the case of the complete graph, the random walk is just choose a uniformly random node at every step. And then the fact that it takes n log n steps to cover the graph, this is the coupon, you know, the classical coupon collector analysis. But for instance, I mean, some, somehow already this is a bit non-trivial, right? I mean, it's, you have to do something even though it's really just a, like the mixing time on the complete graph is just one. You just take one step and you add a random vertex. The com the com you know, somehow the cover time is already slightly non-trivial there. And then sort of for expanders, it's just sort of uh, the cover time is n log n. For, for grids, you have various results. 
uh, proved by Aldis, and, and then sort of, uh, it's, it's also known, for instance, if you take complete regular trees, what the cover time is up to a constant factor. So I mean, you sort of, uh, uh, okay, so it's, it's, it's known for, it's been studied for a lot of uh, well-known graphs. And then in general, I should just say that sort of, uh, in a few instances, actually, one can, cat, one can, one can uh, compute the cover time, one can say what it is exactly. Uh, and so in, ge in general, sort of these works can be quite delicate. Uh, when I say exactly, actually, I don't mean exactly, but at least they get the leading constant right, instead of just having the order of magnitude. So all these did this for regular trees. Cooper and Fries did this for the giant component of random graphs, and then sort of this work of Dembo et al. for the discrete torus, or balls in like the integer lattice. Um, for every graph, you also, that for every graph, it's for the only elements. Okay, so. Yeah, so, okay, so, for, so it's also known that sort of you have various results for, for every graph, so at least in this case, in this case for simple graphs. So uh, basically in the first work to consider this, this notion, uh, Elunas, Karp, Lipton, Lovas, and Rakoff showed that sort of the cover time of any graph is bounded by twice the number of edges times the number of vertices, so it's always order of n cubed. And then Feige, Feige actually, Feige showed that in fact it's always at most 4 n cubed over 27, which, which turns out to be tight, so 4 27 is the best possible upper bound you can prove here. And then uh, it's known that the cover time of any graph must be at least uh, quantitatively, at least the cover time you know, up to this little of one term, the, co the cover time of the complete graph. Okay, it must be n log n. So we, with, with some constant here, this follows from work of Matthews that I'll talk about in a minute. And then Feige got sort of the constant one minus little of one. Just interestingly, it's still, it's still an open problem to say that the complete graph actually minimizes this, this value among all n node graphs. So it, it's, it's conjectured that if you, if you look among all n node graphs and the, the complete graph really has the minimal cover time, but this is still open. I mean, it's only known up to this little of one term. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, so the, the, the worst case is, uh, is, yeah, is the barbell. So it's, it's, it's a clique uh, connected to a path for various choices of the length of this path and the size of the clique. And uh, well, this is, yeah, I don't know, this is not really a barbell, this is a... a a lollipop, yeah. <laughs> oh, I was going to, yeah, okay. There's another it's interesting an result that uh, if the graph is regular, it doesn't matter what the degree is, and there's an upper bound of n squared. Right. Uh, yeah, so in fact, uh, uh, yeah, and uh, there is actually a lot of uh, work that I'm sort of uh, bypassing in this introduction. Uh, uh, so, so in particular, like to get n cubed, you have to have like a Very, uh, d d points up to n, like uh, between different degrees. Uh, yeah. So okay, and, and let me want mention one more sort of sort of very uh, uh, important connection that will be important for us as well, which is that uh, sort of this uh, this this uh, which was sort of first uh, uh, discovered in this work of Chandra, Raghavan, Russo, Smolensky, and Tavari, uh, which is that the the commute times these distances actually can be related to some sort of uh, properties of the of the graph thought of as an electrical network. So I'm not really going to go into it too much, but, but basically if you, t if you take the graph and you put it sort of a, 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 let's say a unit resistance wire on every edge and then you induce a voltage difference of one between two nodes, then uh, you can say well, the, the effective resistance is defined as the actual the inverse of the current flowing from U to V in this setup. Okay, that's the effective resistance. It's the, it's the resistance as if, as if we just had U and V and not, none of the rest of the graph and some wire between them. It's sort of the effective resistance of that imaginary wire that is given by the whole graph. That's the effective resistance. And it turns out that there's this sort of, basically the effective resistance and the commute time are the same thing. So the, com the commute time between U and V is just twice the number of edges in the graph times the effective resistance between U and V. Okay? Uh, and this is going to be really important uh, later because this, this is, is endows our metric with some sort of very special geometric properties that come from effective resistance metrics. Yeah? Is there any relationship to Uh, well, there is a very, okay, so, uh, I mean, the answer, it depends what you mean. In, 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 the answer is no, but also, but if you, if you allow your question to be answered sufficiently generally, then it's, then it's yes, because, be generally. well, because, I mean, uh, so the answer is not, there is nothing this clean that relates the, I mean, this is, this is a symmetric quantity, so if you, there is not, there, there are formulas, they're just not this clean, okay, they involve a summation over vertices in the graph. Yeah, I mean, of course. Yeah. Yeah, so there's work of Titali you can, we can talk about it, which gives a formula for the hitting time in terms of resistances, but but not not with one term. Yeah. Okay. You show the formula later for people who don't know. Which formula? The, what is the, you know, 
No, so the point is this means you don't have to understand what it is because it's really just yeah. the commute time. Okay. But <laughs> uh, no, 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 because no, no. So I, I won't show the formulator. You'll see we have enough work ahead of us already. But uh, uh, the point is that now you have all these, you know, these laws, Kirchhoff and Ohm's law and so forth from electrical network theory that tell you things about these distances. And now you can use things to prove things about the geometry of this metric, and that's going to be central later on. Okay. Uh, okay, so let me say a bit about computation of these various values. So if you want to compute hitting time, uh, uh, like deterministically in polynomial time, it's, it's very easy because you can just write down a system of linear equations. Right? The hitting time from vertex to itself is just zero because they're already there. And then the hitting time from u to v is just, well, you take one step and then average over all the neighbors of u the hitting time from that vertex to v. And this gives you a system of linear equations in the hitting time that now you can just you can solve them and you can so this allows you to compute for instance the hitting time exactly in deterministic polynomial time, and then I'll leave it as an exercise. But by using this observation, you can actually show how to compute the cover time in deterministic exponential time just by thinking of the cover time as the hitting time of some set-valued process on the graph. Uh, you can I mean it's a it's an exercise. You can uh, probably almost see see what's going on now. Uh, and of, of course, you can, compute, you can compute the cover time in a randomized way very easily because we know that the cover time is, is order n cubed of any graph. So just run the random walk you know, 100 times until it covers the graph 100 times and take the, you know, take the median. Then this will give you a fairly accurate estimate as to the cover time. But for uh, deterministic algorithms, it appears to be uh, sort of uh, significantly harder to, in polynomial time to get at what the cover time is. So let me just mention sort of a sequence of results. So. Uh, uh, okay, so yeah, so I mean, there was a sort of a log n approximation that follows from work of Matthews. Uh, in this really uh, beautiful work of Kant, Kim, Lovas, and Vu, it was shown how you can do something sort of uh, uh, really beautiful using Matthews bound to get actually a log log n squared approximation to this quantity. So it's a deterministic algorithm that runs in polynomial time. Uh, and outputs a value which, was, which is within log log n squared of the cover time of the graph. Um, and, and, uh, and then I should mention a very recent work of uh, Feige and Zaytuni actually showed that for trees you can get something very good. You can get a 1 plus epsilon approximation for every epsilon. And in fact, you can even take epsilon there to be 1 over polynomial and still get an efficient algorithm. And then, uh, but, but sort of one, one basic question has, has remained open, sort of does there exist a, an order one approximation for general graphs, which is deterministic. So in other words, is there an algorithm which I give you a graph, it does something deterministic, and somehow figures out what the cover time is up to a constant factor. So this was open. We'll resolve this, we'll resolve this today. Uh, here's sort of one question which indicates that sort of structurally, the cover time is maybe you know, not as well understood as we would have liked. Uh, uh, yeah. You define cover time in one particular way, starting at the worst vertex. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, so, so, so I will not say anything about it. For the stationary distribution, uh, uh, you can say you can say something. For the for the case of an arbitrary vertex, uh, you, uh, we, for instance, for an arbitrary vertex, we cannot solve this problem. The the the, oh. the problem of given an arbitrary vertex, what's the cover time from that? Then it's still, you know, uh, it's still open. Uh, and and oh, wait, you'll see why that happens later. Uh, okay. Uh, let me mention let me mention a couple of more. Yeah. No, no, the algorithm just gets the graph. So the, the point is that, and we'll see in a second, the, there, there's a much more robust parameter, which is the cover and return time. So start at a node, wait till you cover the graph, and then return to that node. For, for this parameter, all, the cover time from any node is within a constant factor. And so, so you know, really, this is, the, this is the quantity we care about. Mathematically, this quantity turns out to be much nicer than the cover time itself. Okay? It's probably, the, you know, in some sense, the right parameter to be studying here. Uh, Okay. Um, okay. So let me mention a couple more open open questions in this in this arena that we'll that we'll tackle. Uh, so uh, so Winkler and Zuckerman in '96 wrote this paper uh, about something they called blanket times. The idea is that sort of the cover time looks at how you know you run the random walk until every node has has been visited at least once. The blanket time, what you want to do is you want to run the random walk until every node has been visited about as many times as you expect it to be visited at stationarity. So in other words, if I run it, so the, the beta blanket time is the first time t. Uh, at which every node has been visited at least, you know, so think about beta as a half, uh, pi of x times t over two times, where pi of x is the stationary probability. So, so at stationarity, I expect that every node should be visited pi of x times t times. The blanket time is the first time at which this is sort of, all the nodes have been sort of like well enveloped by this random walk up to some factor beta of what you expect at stationarity. Okay, so it's obvious that the blanket time is bigger than the cover time. I mean, I, I can't, uh, 
I can't blanket the nodes until I've covered them. This is, of course, the point of the names. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, so if, it's, if, 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 I have, if, if, this, if this quantity is 0, then it doesn't hold for any beta that's not that be, any beta bigger than 0. Uh, but what they conjectured is actually that, the, that uh, if I go for the cover time and then a bit more, actually, you, you do blanket the graph. So what they conjecture is that for every beta, uh, that the cover time and, uh, and the blanket time are proportional. So they, when I use this notation, this just means uh, are theta of each other. They're the same up to some constant factors, yeah. Uh, th so there, there are relationships, but none of them are tight. So there's no, so I mean, uh, for instance, the, the, I mean the. So the blanket time and the mixing time shouldn't be also. Uh, uh, no, so the, the blanket time is bigger than the cover time, right? But even, even for the complete, the, it's bigger. It takes longer to blanket the graph. The mixing time. Right, but the mix, so the mixing time for the complete graph is, is one, and it's n log n for the cover time, and also n log n for the blanket time with some. And, and in general, it can also be the same. For various graphs, like for the for the path, you'll have you'll mix and cover at the same amount of time. So, in general, there's not a tight relationship between the two. No, no, no. So, yeah. The complete graph. Uh, it might still be an interesting question, but I'll come back to it. <laughs> uh, okay, so. Uh, so, so in this paper, they proved for many interesting sort of uh, special cases. And then in this work of uh, Khan, Kim, Lovas, and Vu, they showed that it's true up to a log log n squared factor. So these two quantities for any n node graph are within a, a log log n squared factor. Um, OK, so we'll talk about the resolution of this in a second. Let me just mention one more very natural question, which, uh, well, I'll mention in sort of an open question that, that this one also solves. If you take two graphs in the same set of nodes, and suppose now I tell you that that all the commute times in G are less than the commute times in G prime. Is it the case that, I mean, now we, ex then we, ex I mean, we kind of expect that the cover time in G should be less than the cover time in G prime. But even, even this question was open. Is it the case that if all the commute distances go down, then somehow the cover time, uh, in this case, we're just asking if, it, if, it's, if it's sort of majorized by a constant factor times the cover time in G prime. So it's sort of some kind of comparison theorem. If I decrease all the, 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 the the commute times, does the cover time also go down? Uh, so we'll answer this uh, in a second as well. And it was sort of another example of an interesting question, which was, which was open there. OK. So now I'm going to state the main theorem. And um, Don't what's that? Don't no, no, I just wanted to, I was going to give an accurate estimate of how much, uh, well, I have to hurry. Somebody's leaving in, t in 10 minutes. But <laughs> 10 minutes to. Uh, OK, so, so I'm going to state the main theorem. And, and uh, probably most people won't understand the main theorem, not as a fault of your own, as a fault of me, the speaker. But then I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes explaining what the main theorem means. And, and it might be that even, <laughs> even this is the, sort of the, the most important, you know, one of the more important parts of the talk, because uh, somehow this theory seems like it should have many applications in computer science, but maybe it's not well so, so well known. OK, so here's the main theorem. Uh, it's not, it's not the Talagon <laughs> introduced to functional. Uh, so, 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 so there's a functional Talagon, which I'll spend the next 10 minutes explaining. <laughs> uh, uh, which, which, so given any metric space, there is some value, gamma 2 of the metric space. Um, so th this, is some, this is some sort of uh, positive real number assigned to every metric space. And so here is our main theorem. If for any graph G, the cover time of G is proportional to the gamma 2 value of the following metric space squared. So you take, the, you take the graph, and instead of equipping it with the commute time, you equip it with the square root of the commute time. Okay, so by concavity, the commute time is a metric, the square root is also a metric. So this is some metric on the graph. Now then you take the gamma 2 value, sort of Talagrand's gamma 2 value, and you square it. It turns out that for every graph, these two quantities are uh, equivalent up to some constant, some universal constant factor. Okay, so the cover time of every graph is proportional to the gamma 2 value of the graph equipped with the square root of the commute time quantity squared. Um, okay, so now let me just, so as some consequences, sort of, one, we, we answer this sequence of open questions. So for instance, uh, then in the paper we give, we give for any metric space a constant factor approximation for gamma 2. So of course, that gives the same thing for, you know, deterministic constant factor approximation. Of course, that gives the same thing for the cover time. Um, I'll mention in, this, in a second why it positively resolves the blanket time conjectures, but it's not too difficult to show that with this uh, in hand, uh, you, you sort of also solve the blanket time conjectures so that the blanket time of a graph is, is proportional to its cover time for every graph G. And then 
you also get this kind of comparison theorem. So here I state it in a slightly different way, sort of a bilipstrad stability. So if the commute, if if you have, if the commute metrics on two graphs are the same up to a constant factor, it implies that their cover times are also proportional. And actually, I mean, uh, Alexandra asked this question like a couple months ago at Microsoft, if you t where if you take G and you take a spectral sparsifier of G, so spectral spar, I won't say what it is. It's been a lot of work on these things recently. Then do they have the same cover time? So this shows that the answer is yes. Okay, that for us, then, okay, just as an example of sort of what this kind of comparison theorem gives. Because gamma 2 is the same. Uh, I should say, because, because gamma 2 is, well, uh, what's that? No, because, because gamma 2 is just, is just trivially always decreasing in distances. So if you decrease any distance, gamma 2 will decrease. I mean, sort of, and it, it's, it's, it's straight, it's, it follows immediately from the definition of gamma 2, which you haven't, which sort of we haven't seen yet. Uh, oh, if, if you're asking why the commute times are the same, it's yes, it's because they're sort of, they can be, they can be they can be sort of relate. They can you can you can define the commute distance in terms of the 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 spectrum of the inverse of the Laplacian. Well, which is the same thing as the yeah. It's not true for the hitting time as well. It's not true for the hitting time as well. Uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, yeah. The, the truth is, I, I I actually uh, I haven't thought about it. It's an interesting question. So uh, whether it holds for the hitting time. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't know the answer. Say, say it again. Uh, it's it's a, it's it's a graph where um, uh, basically all of the if you if you sort of these this is the LG is the Laplacian of the graph. It's a graph G prime where sort of where all these uh, inner products are proportional. So somehow somehow spectrally in this sense. G is approximating G prime, but uh, what's that? Oh, I mean, I, and now and now G prime will be much sparser. So it was recently proved. Uh, yeah. But that doesn't have nothing to do with. Yeah, this doesn't have anything to do with this statement. So maybe it's it's uh, 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 it, it will have no bearing on any of the talk. But we, you can it's it's a notion like this, except that you now you want G prime to be much sparser than G. So so this is turns out to have a number of applications. Uh, okay. So and and the reason sort of this. I mean, the, the simple reason why this resolves the blanket time conjecture is just because the theorem is proved in the following way. We have there, this, this relationship, as I said, is trivial. The cover time is always at most of blanket time. The, the, you know, the way we prove the theorem is, is actually the upper bound bounds the blanket time and the lower bound lower bounds the cover time. So, okay, so you get the blanket time. Uh, yeah. you, get, you get sort of, you resolve these uh, blanket time conjectures for free in that sense. Okay. So again, again here's, here's the main theorem. For any graph G, the cover time is proportional to the square of this gamma 2 value of the graph equipped with the square root of the commute time. And also, and this denotes that there's some constant depending on delta here. This is also proportional to the blanket times, sort of to the, for the delta blanket times for any delta. OK. So, so now uh, what I'm going to do for the next 10 minutes is try and explain what this parameter is, what this parameter gamma 2 is, and why it would come up here. Because if, if, you, if, if anybody knows what it is, it's actually very surprising that it would come up here. Now you'll is see. This the gamma 2 in this telegram? Yeah, this is telegram's gamma 2. Okay, so. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. So in general, if you have if d is a metric, the square root will also be a metric just by yeah, just by concavity. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah. So and this is gamma two is as I said before is is Telegram's sort of functional. Okay. So, which is defined for any metric space. So he he only cared about it for very specific metric spaces initially in his work. Okay. So what are these spaces? Well. <laughs> they come from Gaussian processes. So let me tell you what is a Gaussian process. Well, it's just a collection of, uh, of, of normal random variables. In our case, we're going to take it to be centered, so they're going to have mean zero, such that every linear combination of them is again normal. Every finite linear combination is again normal. Okay? So it's some collection of joint Gaussian random variables. Um, and, uh, okay. so, and I'll, I'll say in a second sort of a different way to interpret this. So this process comes with sort of this, a very natural metric, which is the L2 distance on the space of random variables. So in general, when you see this distance d throughout, throughout the talk, it's going to be this following metric, the square root of the expectation of xs minus xt squared. Uh, it's very, well, one reason it's very natural is because if I give you a Gaussian process, then up to translation, so what I mean by up to translation is, I mean, obviously this, this distance doesn't change if I translate all the random variables by some, by some factor or by some, by some term. Up to translation, these distances determine the process. Right, this is yeah, so. This process is exactly determined by the covariances by expectation x u x v. So this this distance basically characterizes the process. So sort of you can think about this as a geometric object. And for especially for people who are sort of uh, 
computer scientists who are sort of are used to uh, thinking about uh, random projections and so forth, we can th you can think about such a process in a different way. Uh, so if, if, your set, if your set is finite, and for us, we're only going to consider sort of finite sets of random variables the whole time, then you can think of a process in the following way. Just take some set of points in Euclidean space, okay, some set of points S in Euclidean space, and now the process is just the every random variable is that you sort of choose a random direction and project all the points on that direction. So that's the process. That gives you a collection of random variables. And, and now this distance is just the Euclidean distance between the points. Up to some, up, there's some scaling uh, going on here, depending on whether this is sort of norm one or not. But so, so in general, and in fact, I will conflate them throughout the course of the talk, but the, the best way to think about this is given a, uh, this Gaussian process, it's just a collection of points in Euclidean space that it's endowed with a geometry coming from Euclidean space. And, and, uh, and now we care about our, sort of this family of random variables, right? They're high, of course, they're correlated. They depend on the structure of the point in this space, in this sort of like in this Euclidean space. They depend on the, the distance structure of the points. Uh, but this is the process. You take a bunch of points, you choose a random direction, project them onto that direction. You get a bunch of values. That's the values. Those are the values of the random variables. No, no, this is a random. So, so for every, every, every point you and I set gives us a random variable, which is the, yeah. The direction is a uniformly random, no, no, no S, S is a fixed set. We choose a uniformly random vector and, you know, no, this is just, the inner product is the. the, direction. the no, I mean, uh, okay, uh, this is, okay. Okay, okay, sorry. Okay. I think of, well, I, I mean, I, yeah, so, so in general, in fact, this is the way I'm going to draw a picture of the talk. I think of the process as being like this. I have a bunch of points. I choose a random direction, and now these are the values. So it's, it's somehow it's better to have G being fixed and think about everything projecting onto you. So I didn't tell you what we care about about this process yet. So then maybe. No, 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 no. So they they have some. They they they're arbit It's an arbitrary process. So every linear combination is normal. Every linear combination of these. Yeah, I mean. Uh, the point is this that you have. I mean. It's uh, yeah. So if you take a linear combination, it's it's, it's sort of it's again uh, just a. I mean, it's again just a normal, normal random variable. Zero, that's okay. What's that? Yeah, 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 I mean, one of these random variables might be zero. In fact, it, it will make sense to make one of them always zero. So, uh, yeah, this, this property is what allows you to say that actually this is what a Gaussian process is, this sort of thing here. Okay, so what was Talagrand considering? Well, he had, he had a number of applications in mind, but the, but the main thing that comes up uh, in his work is what is the expected maximum of this process, okay? So in other words, I have, I have sort of, uh, these points, think about this, this direction g. Uh, I, what I'm interested in is, is really the, what's going on at the tail. What's, what's sort of, you know, what's sort of, I'm interested in the abnormal behavior of this process. What's the expected largest, largest uh, projection here, the expected largest random variable in this family? Okay? So, uh, I mean, in general, of course, this is going to be, if you, have a, if, you have a lot of, if you have a lot of points, this is going to be much larger than, for instance, the standard deviation of any single one. It's going to be, this, is some, this, this represents some exceptional event in the process, something which is out near the tail. Okay? So, this is, so this is what, uh, what Talagrand wanted to study. Okay? Okay, so now we know they want to study it, so let's, let's look at some interesting, uh, some interesting sort of uh, special cases to try to get some idea of what, of what this quantity should look like, and then we'll develop the definition of gamma 2. Uh, so the first thing is suppose that all the points are at sort of pairwise distance alpha. Okay, so let's suppose that, you know, in other words, if they have a bunch of points in Euclidean space, all distances between them are alpha. Then what you might expect is that in this case, uh, somehow since everything is uniform, somehow the union bound would be tight. Okay, so, okay, so like somehow if the, you know, for instance, if, if you just take uh, n iid normal zero ones, then the maximum will be about square root log n. Okay. And, uh, and this is exactly what's given to you by sort of just the union bound of saying, what's the probability that any one of them becomes square root log n, and then taking a union bound over all n. So in general, I mean, you have this kind of Gaussian concentration. So, so we, can, let's, we can translate the process. So let's assume that one of the points is at, is at 0. And then what this says is that the probability of getting some value bigger than, bigger than lambda is at most, in this case, exponential in minus lambda squared over alpha. Okay? So if you, if you apply the, if you have k points, and sort of you apply the union bound here, then what that would give you if, you, if you just check, if you want this probability to be about 1 over k, you would set lambda to be about alpha times square root log k, right? 
So, so if you have k points and all distances are about alpha, you, you might expect, I mean, the union bound says that the, that, the, that the expected maximum is at most, you know, is order of alpha square root log k, right? Just, just plug it in and take a union bound. And you might expect that in this case, when the geometry is uniform, this bound is tight, okay? It's tight, it's definitely tight in the IID case when you take just sort of I, n IID normal zero ones. Okay, and this, this is actually true. It follows from uh, sort of a classical uh, uh, lemma. It's a, well, it depends on how you prove it, whether it's a lemma or a theorem. But uh, uh, so it's sort of well understood how to prove things like that, just like these days. Uh, so if you have a Gaussian process and all the pairwise distances are at least alpha, then what this Sudokov minoration tells you is that the expected maximum is at least alpha square root log the number of points. So it says if you have a uni if you have some uniform lower bound on all the distances, then uh, then you can sort of, in other words, if all distances are about alpha, then the union bound is tight. So you can match the union bound. So at least in this one case where the geometry is uniform, we understand what's going on. Is this non-trivial? Um, what's non-trivial about this? So the problem is that of course these the the these are not independent. So they can they can they can depend on each other in a, in sort of any way you want. It's non-trivial assuming uh, some kind of comparison theorem. So for instance, here is something which is not clear but it's true. Uh, if you take a bunch of points in Euclidean space and you shrink and you contract all the distances, so all the distances go down, then this parameter also goes down. When I say contract all the distances, I mean sort of it could be a different set of points, but just all the pairwise distances in one majorize those in the other, then this expected maximum always goes down. Intuitively, it seems true. If the, if the distances decrease, then somehow the, the variance of the process decreases, so the expected maximum would decrease. But of course, the, yeah, the, the configuration of the points, yeah, so it's not, it's not completely trivial. You have to prove it. It's something called Slepian's lemma. With that, this is easy because now you can you just transform these random variables into I into just like simplex. orthogonal into a simplex, yeah, into just orthogonal vectors. You pay some you pay some you know in, in, into orthogonal vectors with distances alpha, and you, you you pay something for the right. So I mean if yeah, and and then and then you can say that I mean you pay something because in order to in order to make sure the distances are decreasing, the the distances of, in the end are going to be not alpha but only order but only theta of alpha. But then, and then in the IID case, you prove this, and now you use the comparison theorem, and you get it for an arbitrary process. But it's the related to these rounding algorithms for unique games, the Stark uh, Macaulay, Macaulay table. Uh, yeah, but yes, yes, but in a in a sort of in that case, in a kind of uh, yeah, I mean, th th definitely, yeah. This in the in the way that sort of there, what they really care about is is the worst case for k points, and it's like, that's where the square root log k comes from. Uh, uh, I mean, yeah, so they again do it for the independent case, but in that case, if you don't want to characterize it, you only need the upper bound. You don't need to say that it matches the lower bound. Okay, uh, and this, this Slepian lemma is not, is, is like Sorry, only. I'm confused, yeah. the, there's. You had the alternative definition of, you know, of the Gaussian process. Yeah. N, yeah. IID and then in a part. Mm-hmm. No, no, the, the because, no, no, the, I mean, if, if you, if you, no, the, because we, there you choose the same vector g for all of them at the same, t at the same time. The values are, look like this, right, this is, this is sort of one, you know, how do I generate the randoms? I generate a random g and then project them all into g. So they're correlated, right? I mean, if I take two points that are close together and I take a point which is far apart, these are going to be, these are going to tend to project close together. Yeah. These are going to tend to project close together and this one is going to tend to project far away. And, and in general, for instance, in the way that I drew them, if I tell you these two projections, it determines this one. So, you know, there's, okay, so there's, you know, okay. So, so, so the point is, uh, in a not too difficult way, one can understand the uniform case. And now let's try, to un let's try to use the uniform case to actually say something for every process. Yeah. Uh, 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 well, in, in some sense, you, you, I mean, sort of, uh, dev, the other thing you can say is that this expected maximum always goes down if you pass to a subset of the points. So, so my, even if you, only, if, you, if you only had this for, like, if, if this only holds for, I mean, it's an interesting question. The answer is yes, but depending on, y the answer is yes, and you can, and, and I don't know exactly what the precise answer is, I have to think about it, but you can do it in your head. It's going to involve the argument of extracting from that condition a uniform subset. So you know, some kind of subset where most of the inner products are, I mean, most of these distances are at least alpha, and then you'll be able to say something. But. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, so in this case, we see the union bound is tight, but now let's suppose that our points are clustered somehow. Then now it's pretty clear that the union bound is going to be very bad. I mean, we don't want to just compute the worst case maximum for all these points and take a union bound, because in these clusters, the points tend to project together, and that's going to be a vast overshot on the expected maximum. So there's a very natural thing to do here, which is, uh, and I, which I've already done, sort of, let's take one point in every cluster, and now let's, let's first take our union bound just over, over or sort of these values. So again, let's think about this as zero, and then you can think about sort of this, this difference here. Uh, you know, okay, so uh, think about this as zero, so this is really the magnitude of this, this variable. We just, you know, the first thing we can do is take a union bound over these blue points, okay? So we already said these blue points, if they're uniform, the union bound is going to be fairly tight. And that's going to control what happens for them. And now, and now we just sort of analyze each cluster independently and take a, like a mini union bound in every cluster. Okay? And you know, in this picture, this, is, this seems like this is going to be, I mean, this is going to give a better result than just taking a union bound over all of them because, well, because, uh, because since these points are, are closer to this point, these, these, these projections are going to tend to be much, much smaller than, than sort of the maximum possible projection. Okay? So the idea is you sort of take a union bound over the worst case here, take a union bound in every cluster, and then now you can bound the maximum by the, the sort of the sum of the maximum purple edge plus the maximum yellow edge. In fact, you can do better, right? You can, you can bound it by the sum of the maximum purple yellow path, right? Okay. But of course, now if I'm taking a two-level union bound, I shouldn't stop there. I should keep going, all right? So, okay. So that leads us to this idea of, of a covering tree. Okay, so, uh, okay, so again, this, this, this is our metric space. Just, our, it, just think of it as a set of points in Euclidean space. And, but of course, what I'm going to say here is general for any metric space. So it doesn't, it doesn't depend on the fact that you're in Euclidean space. Uh, and let's think about some sequence of recursive partitions. So I don't know if you can see this one, but it's, there are green lines there. Uh, some sequence of recursive partitions of this space. And, 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 and of course, associated with sequence of partitions, we can construct a tree on the space as well. So sort of the root node corresponds to the whole space. Now I break the space here into five pieces. I get a tree which has five children. I can again, I've chosen horrible colors, obviously, but uh, I can again sort of uh, partition every piece into further clusters. In fact, I think like in real life, these are very different colors, but those are very different. <laughs> those are very different. Those are very different yellows. Uh, all right, so again, we can partition every piece, and then I got sort of, you know, sort of, I'll just partition one piece here, and so on. Okay, so to every to every sort of recursive partitioning of a space, just a sequence of refined partitions, of course, we can associate some tree. Okay, which is just the which is just represents the structure of this partition. Is the yeah. partition special? Uh, so right now what I'm saying is for any partition. So, uh, but okay, so yeah, yes, the partition is special. <laughs> so yeah, so let's suppose that I mean I, I want the partition to match the sort of clustering I was talking about before. So let's suppose that in our in our partition, uh, let's suppose just by normalization the diameter of our whole space is one, and then at every step the you know at level j these pieces these sets have a diameter at most four to the minus j. Four is the arbitrary number, but just they have exponentially decreasing diameters. Okay, so, okay. so, so basically I want to say that any such partition of the space re, uh, is going to give me an upper bound on the expected maximum of this process in accord with this sort of like this, this recursive clustering picture we talked about before. Um, so how do we do that? Well, uh, what we're going to do is just, yeah, we, we take this partition, now we're just going to sort of construct at every, at every node the same way we did before, we're going to do a, a union bound at every node of the tree, and then and then somehow the expected maximum is going to be proportional, is going to be controlled by the, the longest root leaf path in this tree. If, when I say longest, I mean think about labeling an edge of the tree by the difference between these two values. Think about this as zero, so the, the expected maximum is going to be controlled by the longest path in this, in this tree. Okay? And, and so let's think about what this path should be, given what I said before. Well, sort of, um, I claim that we should think about the value of this path as being the sum you know, so a four to, the, four to the minus j times the square root log of the degrees we see down the path. And this makes sense given what I said before. Sort of, okay, so at the first node we have these, we have, we have five points. We know that the distance, the diameter of space is one, so the distance between all these five points is at most one. Um, uh, so we know from sort of the, sort of the tail bound that, we, that, we, that the, the maximum value here should be at most, you know, one times square root log five. Right, that's the first level, and then and then at the next level, sort of you know, sort of you know, at the at the next level here, these these distances we know that this this cluster has diameter at most one fourth, so these distances are at most one fourth, and there are again there are d sub two of them, so we should be able to say that the maximum here is one fourth times square root log d sub two, just by applying a union bound. Now apply a union bound over the whole tree. It's not completely trivial, but just think, just suppose for the sake of it that you can apply a union bound over the whole tree, and then. Uh, the union bound that you prove for the whole space is exactly, well, for this path, 
we can we can, we know that the 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 value is sort of the the the, the, the difference between here and here is going to be at most uh, you know there's a constant here but at most this sum four to the minus h square root log j this is the sort of the the bound on the projections at every level and now of course we want an upper bound so we should take the worst possible path okay so so th that's what this vowel sub c is so c stands for covering tree the value of this covering tree is just the maximum of the value of a path over every possible root leaf path in the tree okay so somehow the value does not involve another factor of j it does not in Involve another factor of j. You mean you mean you mean if you think about how to do the union bound, you might naively not not you personally, but one might one might one might naively lose another factor of j, uh, right? So it, it doesn't happen, and it's not it's not uh, uh, it's not so difficult to see why. Basically, you borrow a little bit from this bound in order to make sure that all these bounds are fine. So it's a little it's but it's a, it's like a little charging trick. It's it's cute, but it's not something. But but yeah, you can really. I mean, I, we we didn't prove it, but I want you to believe that you can really. That this, this bound, this this value for any tree t, this this value of the tree gives you an upper bound in the expected maximum, uh, up to a constant. I mean, there's some constant that I'm not considering here. Okay, um, and now that I can tell you what gamma two is, so gamma two is is well, there are a number of different ways you can say it. For the sake of this talk, let's say it this way. Uh, basically, gamma two is the is the upper bound that you get on the expected maximum by taking the best possible tree. So every tree gives you an upper bound. Take the best upper bound. This is gamma two that I defined earlier. So it's, it's, it's the value of the best possible covering tree in the space. Covering trees with this kind of yeah, so, so it'd be covering tree, you have to have this property. I mean, if you don't have the diameter conditions, then you won't be able to get sort of this, this behavior here. Uh, OK. Yeah. So the, for general metric, it's defined the same way with the square root log j? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so I mean, so, th so this, this, of course, doesn't, I mean, this doesn't depend in any way on the, 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 the Gaussian geometry. This, this is something you can do for an arbitrary metric space, and it's, it's the same way with the square root log. And the, the two in the gamma two refers to the square root. But, okay. Uh, so the so what we've argued at least informally is that we should be able to bound the expected maximum by this gamma two value of the metric space, which is just the best upper bound you can prove by a tree. Okay. Um, and so now now what you'd like to do is you'd like to say well how how badly you know did I do how far apart are these two quantities? Okay. And. Um, so, OK, so this proves an upper bound. Now, suppose you want to prove a lower bound than this expected maximum, right? So there's a very natural thing to do. On the, I mean, one side is called covering trees. The next slide should be called packing trees. And, uh, and, now, and now you can, you know, sort of we, a packing tree is, instead of a covering tree, what we do is we sort of like, uh, uh, now we're going to take sort of a recursive sequence of sets in the space, but they're not necessarily a partition. And what we require is that every sort of like these green sets are, are far, are sort of the, the distance between these green sets is far apart. And then at the next level, there are yellow sets which have smaller diameter, and distance between those are far apart. So I'm sort of, um, okay, so you sort of you construct this kind of packing tree. I mean, it's really a packing tree, right? It's, I mean, it's like a, now, now you, you choose sets which are not the whole space, but, but just subsets, and then you can build another tree on those. And now what we're going to do is, you know, to prove the upper bound, we use, uh, we use basically a bunch of tail bounds over this tree. To prove the lower bound, we're going to use this Sudikov minoration over the entire tree. Okay, uh, so so again, you can do the sort of the 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 same thing and argue that sort of you know what we said is that okay, all all of these sort of green clusters. Let's fix a point in every one. They have the, these points are all mutually far apart. So Sudikov minoration says that I should get uh, at least you know if there are k points here, I should get one which is value at least square root log, square root log k, and then. You know, but then sort of that's that. But then I can continue down the tree. I can try to get a little bit more at this level, a little bit more at this level, and so what it makes sense for a packing tree to define the value is okay. So if you think about what happens in a packing tree, how are we going to eventually get some very large value? Well, sort of at each level, we sort of we we apply this minoration, and we know that there is one exceptional event. Okay, okay, and then at the next level, we again apply it, and then we get another exceptional event, and eventually we get some path from root to leaf, but we don't get to choose which path. It comes, you know, it's just given to us, right? Because it's built up by this process of, of just always choosing, you know, uh, one edge out of every vertex that has a large value. So it makes sense to define the value of a packing tree instead of as the, the maximum overpass, as the minimum overall pass. So now I, in, instead of looking at the, now I use the same value, but I'm, use, but I'm looking at the minimum. This is the value of a packing tree. Okay, and again, a packing tree is just, I, I didn't, I mean, I'm just stating it informally, but it's, it's basically these sets at every level, the distance between these two sets is, is like uh, is like four to the minus j at every level, okay? 
And I argue it's, it's not that hard to show that, that uh, this, this holds as well. So th this is what we argued in the last slide. The expected maximum is bounded by the value of any cover tree. I claim that the expected maximum is also lower bounded by the value of any packing tree. Okay? So now we have upper bounds and lower bounds. Um, and, and here's the sort of the main technical theorem of majorizing measures that actually uh, the value of the best packing tree and the best covering tree are within a constant factor of each other. So, so this upper bound, this, this sort of when I take the best possible tree here, the best possible cover tree here, and best possible packing tree here, these two things are within a constant factor. Of course, you know, this one is gamma 2. So that leads to sort of the majorizing measure theorem, which is that for any Gaussian process, now I'm not taking a finite one, so I'm taking a supremum instead of a maximum, the expected maximum of this process is exactly proportional to the gamma 2 value of this metric space S equipped with the, with the sort of the, the Gaussian, the natural metric that I talked about earlier. So this is gamma 2, OK? He, he, he defined it in order to control the expected maximum of Gaussian processes. And uh, OK, so now let me remind you of our main theorem. Basically, we say that you can also use it to, to control cover times of graphs. So the cover time of a graph, again, is proportional to the gamma 2 value of the metric space, which is the square root of the commute time on the graph quantity squared. This is his book. Yeah, this is his book. And you, it's called the generic chaining. You can see, I mean, this is, this is the chaining. Yeah, yeah. This is, sorry, yes, this is, this is yeah. Um, no. So the algorithm to compute gamma 2 uh, also uses most of the majorizing measure theory. The algorithm is actually very simple. It's a dynamic program. It's not too complicated. But the analysis of it is, is, requires sort of all the theorems we just discussed. So you can find this, uh, this tree, the best tree in the... Um, you can find a tree, which is within a constant of the best tree. Somehow the point is that, you know, the point of the whole theory is that actually this is a very robust value. Right? I mean, if you, if you think about what this packing tree does, it, it, uh, you know, it could throw away, for instance, like a, a constant fraction of the space at every level. So by the end, when you look at the leaves, the leaves are only, you know, you might have, if you start with n points, you might end up with like n to the epsilon leaves. But somehow this is still enough to control the process. Because square root log of this, you know, doesn't, epsilon is not so important, right? Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's now it's a, it's a sort of, a sequence of, they're not partitions, they're just sets, which are, uh, re but each one is a refinement. So each, at each level, the, the sets are subsets of the previous ones. And if I look at the tree, then any two nodes at the same level, the distance between them is at least 4 to the minus j at level j. And you don't need to cover all the nodes. And you don't, no, no. So you definitely you will, not, you will not cover all the nodes. In general, this tree, the leaves of this tree will be a very small subset of the whole space. Um, it's a good question. Of course, it is related somehow to, some, to the sort of some kind of covering entropy of this. Uh, I haven't thought about it too much. I, I, I don't know of any work on it. So I, su I suspect if it was a straightforward connection, someone would have done it. Telegram's work, I mean, is, is fairly is well known in probability. So, uh, but I, it's a, I, I don't know the answer. Uh, oh, we can, we can talk about it, because I, I mean, it's, yeah, this is my question. Wait, so now re the recursion comes from the dynamics. The recursion comes from involving the system at next step. Okay. So, so you, you, so look at, you look at coverings at every step, at step point in time, and you say something about, I see. OK, it's interesting, yeah, OK. Uh, OK, so, so this is the theorem. Now let me try to tell you something about the proof of the theorem. OK. So, uh, so first, let me, yeah, so, I mean, it's not, there's no reason, I mean, th right, the surprising thing is that this involves Gaussian processes and this involves a random walk and a graph, and it's not clear there's any connection between the two. Gamma 2 yeah. because it's L2? Or? Gamma 2, it, t 2 is the square root. So if you, if you alter this, if you put 1 over P instead of 1 half in the, 2 is the square root um, here, is this square root. If you put 1 over P instead of a square root, you get lots of other interesting quantities which can be used to control other things. OK, so, so yeah. So I'll refer to his book in where he sort of you know, uh, goes through a lot of this in, in great detail. Um, so, but here, OK, so, so let me at least try to give you a hint of a connection, which is the re reason we initially thought there was a connection. And then I'll say something more formal. So the, the hint is the, is the following. Uh, well, I told you about two tools that come up in the proof. 
Uh, and now, syntactically, I'm going to claim that these two tools look like other tools that come up when you an analyze cover times. <laughs> this is the. One, one basic question. Yeah. So the Gaussian process is associated with points and equal freedom. Yeah. And the graph? Right. So it should be, it's, a it's surprising. It's like a theorem. No, oh, okay. <laughs> so you haven't explained what No, 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 no. It's, it's yeah, OK, yeah. Uh, I hope now to make it less surprising, but OK. Uh, OK. So, so, let's, so let me give you an analog of each of these. So the first one is this Sudokov minoration. We said if we have a bunch of points which are far apart, pairwise far apart in this Gaussian metric, then the expected maximum is large. So there is so maybe the most classical used bound to analyze cover times is Matthew's bound, which says the following. If I take a subset of nodes in a graph G, um, such that uh, the commute times between u and v are, are all at least alpha for every pair uv in this subset. So every pair in the subset to go from u to v requires time alpha then the cover time is at least alpha log s. Uh, I'm waiting to see if Avi. So it's actually not true. It's actually, you should assume that all the hitting times are at least alpha. This is my overview in the slide. As I wouldn't have mentioned it because I was worried that Avi was going to point it out. But <laughs> uh, so you, think, you should think about this as a generalization of coupon collector. If it, takes, if it takes alpha to sort of move from one coupon to another, then in order to cover all of them, I need at least alpha log s time. OK? OK, so I mean, you're supposed to sort of like uh, see something here, right? So there's there's some similar <laughs> syntax between these two theorems. Um, uh, uh, okay, and and then, then sort of the other thing we used was this was this sort of uh, Gaussian concentration. So uh, there is another sort of concentration that comes up in cover times that was proved in this paper of Kahn, Kim, Lovas, and Vu, which is the following. I don't want to talk very explicitly about this, so so let me just say what these things are. So so basically, this is at time t, look at the number of visits to u. And normalized by the degree. So, so basically, you know, the higher degree nodes in this random walk tend to be visited more, so it makes sense to normalize by the degree. Then basically at some time, at, at time t, oh, uh, all right, so, so this, this should be minus alpha squared here, not minus t squared. So it shouldn't be no t. Ignore the t. Um, so basically at time t, th this inequality claims that sort of the number of times I visited u and the number of times I visited v uh, are pretty close together. OK, you can't take t to be an arbitrary time. Uh, you need to take t to be somehow. You need to go. You need to start a random walk at u and then return to u in order for this to be true. Because I mean, if I start a random walk at u and I, you know, and v is very far away, then it makes sense I would visit u a lot somehow. But okay, before this. But but uh, it says that there's some kind of sub-Gaussian concentration of the local times where where sort of the tail is controlled instead of being here here the tail is controlled by the square of the of the Euclidean distance. Here the tail is controlled by the commute time. Okay. Yeah. This is minus alpha squared. What, what, do, you, what do you mean it says? There's nothing about the evolution of the random walk. It only says after a point onwards, there's the Gaussian concentration that they attain. Uh, yeah, so. It doesn't really say, let's say, after t, t greater than t0, how does the tail evolve? Uh, does the concentration improve? Uh, so the. Uh, the concentration does improve because these quantities get larger. As t gets larger, the number. But the, but the bound this is minus alpha squared. Right. So the bound doesn't say anything about the bound. Uh, no, no. But this alpha is independent of t. It's not alpha times t. It's just an alpha. So the point is that the point, as t gets larger, this does get stronger, right. because alpha is just something that's not, it's not depending on t. Okay. Uh, by the way, let me say this is not mysterious. This is actually fairly simple to prove. Once you only care about two points u and v then the process restricted to these two points is just a two-state Markov chain. And then all I care about is the probability of returning to u before I get to v. And this is, it's well known classically that this, th these probabilities can be stated in terms of the commute times. So, so now you have a two-state Markov chain, and, and now you apply a Chernoff bound, basically, to get this value. But the point is that, look, there's, some, there's again a, some similarity here. To yes. Well, if you. Well, it's very, it's very, I mean, this is, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very weak sort of connection in the sense that this, this is a time, this is, this is a time and this is a number of visits. Yeah, I agree. It's not like a, but you do see that if you want this bound to match up, then you should be taking square roots. But if you want this bound to match up, then you see that you should be taking square roots and then squaring, because here you have to get a difference. So you should be taking, you should be getting square root alpha and then squaring it to get this bound. So that tells you at least why you take square roots and then square. 
that to get the two bounds to make sense with each other. OK. All right. So those are the hints of the connection. And unfortunately, they, they don't lead to any connection. The <laughs> So okay, so the, the basic idea of, of so what would you want to do in this case? You have this tree. So the basic sort of premise for this thing would be sort of like take take this a bunch of separated sets in the graph, okay? And what, what I'd like to argue is look, the, the random walk goes through the graph. And it's about the lower bound. Yeah, let's let's say talk, let's talk about the for yeah, the lower bound, which is the which is the difficult part. The random walk is going through the graph. What I'd like to argue if I want to apply this majorizing measures theory is that when I have these separated sets, you know, okay, so the random walk goes around. Obviously, the random walk, you know, if it's, if it's spending time here, it's not spending time here. So, what, you know, I should expect that if I have a bunch of sets which are far apart, then, and I, and I look at the amount of time that the random walk spends in every set, then for one of the sets, it should be, it should be meager in the sense that the random walk spent an unusually small amount of time in that set, just by random fluctuations of these things. If they're, par, if they're far apart, the amount of time should somehow randomly fluctuate independently, and the amount of time here should be small. Okay? And then what I'd like to do is now apply this theory inside. Now I know I'm here for a small number of sets. I want to do the same thing to these sets and say that the time spent here must have been sort of like it was already exceptionally small here. Now if I look at this process again, here it's even smaller. And, then, and eventually sort of you, you would navigate to a leaf and say, actually, the time spent here was zero. This is how you would somehow lower bound the cover time in terms of these trees. And the reason it doesn't work is because once I tell you, for instance, that anything like the, the, this, this ball ha had the, the random walk spent the minimum amount of time here, the correlations that come up are just like, very difficult to control. Like, how, how is the random walk biased by telling you sort of like uh, what happened in other, like if I tell you what, how much time you spent in each cluster, uh, we have no idea how to control what's going on. With how does that bias the random walk here? How does it change the random process? So somehow applying the theory like this doesn't, doesn't seem to work, which is why this, this, doesn't, this doesn't happen. But there is somehow, OK, something even, even uh, yeah, maybe perhaps even more mysterious in the world that, that allows, us, sort of allows us to control these, these correlations. So, so first of all, let me define the local time. So the local time of the random walk at a vertex V is, is, this, is basically just what I wrote down before. It's the number of visits to V normalized by the degree at time t. So this is so at time t, it's the number of times I visited v normalized by the degree. Given the local time, I can now state for you the following isomorphism theorem. OK, which actually, OK, so what is the isom? So there is, there, is a, there is a sort of a history going back 30 years of these of isomorphism theorems in Gauss, sort of between certain Markov processes and Gaussian processes. Uh, let me state one for you here, and then I'll say something about it. So let me just, so, so here's the theorem. You fix some vertex v0. Uh, I, I, by the way, I've, I've deleted a lot of the words in the theorem, so you can't read the theorem and understand it. Uh, be, but it's actually less under, understandable with the words in it. So, uh, so you start a random walk at v0, and then what you're going to do is you're going to wait until, this is like an inverse time. So you're going to wait until you visited v0 t times. That's what this tau is. Tau of t is, is the random time at which you visited v0 t times. Okay? Um, so the claim is that there is a mean zero Gaussian process such that these two distributions, these two families of random variables have exactly the same law. Okay? So let me say two things about this that you can't see from what's written here. So here the Gaussian process is, is, is on both sides. Everything here is independent of everything here. And furthermore, these two things are independent. So these, these, these are local times in the graph. These are the Gaussian process. These are also independent. This gives some kind of, this isomorphism theorem says that somehow, you know, these local times are in some kind of bizarre way controlled by a Gaussian process. But is, there, is this an embedding of uh, the points in the graph into Euclidean space and then running some you know, Markov process like in Markov type? And, uh, it would be fantastic. So, so OK, so. So, yeah, and, and so there, there is a great book. So, there's a book called Gaussian Processes, Markov Processes in Local Times by Marcus and Rosen, which goes through sort of. There, this is not the only isomorphism theorem. There are tons of these isomorphism theorems. In the introduction to the book, uh, they say, Every time we give a talk about these topics, uh, the most common question asked is, do we have any intuition for what's going on behind the proofs of the isomorphism theorems? Uh, 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 it's a very interesting question that we leave as an exercise for the in interesting reader. So the point is they, <laughs> they, they don't know why it happens. And the way you prove it is you, you take Laplace transforms, the two distributions, and you just the expressions match up. I mean, you can, you can write the Laplace transform in terms of some determinant. And then there is some you know, clever way of writing, of writing this out and looking at the coefficients, and they match up. So you get that they have the same law. OK, so you're, good, good question. So I didn't say what the Gaussian process is. Here's another key fact. The Gaussian process is exactly the one where this Gaussian distance is the square root of the effective resistance between x and y. 
So again, if you don't want to think about effective resistance, this is just the commute time normalized by the number of edges in the graph, just the commute time over 2m. But this Gaussian process is connected to the local time process by the fact that these variables are correlated in this way. The Gaussian distance is the square root of the effective resistance. Say it again. Yeah. Um, uh, again, <laughs> uh, Keith Ball is a reference in Hallegrand's book, but not for this, but not for this reason. Uh, so, so they're not they're not sort of obviously related because they study two different things. But it's not it's not clear that there isn't some relation. I just uh, uh, I don't know what it is. But okay, so so now you have this theorem, which okay. Uh, says something. Okay, the, the whole point is eventually it's going to allow us to control what's going on here. Um, so now let me say, uh, let me, let me, I'll spend about five, five more minutes uh, uh, saying something about the proof. Okay, so the upper bound on the cover time is, is not particularly difficult once you have this theorem. Okay, that the, the cover time is at most this, this value squared. So the reason is just that how do I prove that the upper bound is, is at most this? Well, I run the random walk for like this many steps, and then I want to say that none of these are zero. Okay. But look, look, as, as t goes to infinity, which t is the number of steps of this, t is, t is, the, t is not the number of steps because there's something. Remember, the, the, everything here is a bit complicated. This is a random time that depends on t. Tau of t is a random time at which I visited v0 t times. But ignoring this for the moment, if I run, if, if, as t goes to infinity, I mean, none of the other, I mean, you know, these, the Gaussian process doesn't change. It doesn't evolve with t. The local times change, but the Gaussian process doesn't. So the point is that the Gaussian process is concentrated. So you think about sort of as t gets larger and larger, this, these things stay, stay fixed. So for t large enough, it shouldn't be the case. For t large enough, this thing has to be, these things have to be getting bigger. I mean, OK, so what I'm saying is basically set t to be this value, that, or this value times 10. This value is exactly the expected maximum of this process. And it's known that the expected maximum of the Gaussian process is highly concentrated. So sort of like. As you make t 10 times this, this thing stays small and this thing stays small. You know, in fact, the, and what I'm saying is sort of the, the infimum of this, the minimum value here stays, stays uh, I guess I should say, that, OK, the soup stays small. The infimum stays big. So, so this stays big and this stays big. The only way that can happen is if this is getting bigger, because this is concentrated. So I don't know that it made a lot of sense. But the point is the upper bound follows rather easily from this. And so easily that also the blanket time follows the upper bound on the blanket time, not just the cover time, follows easily from this. The lower bound is somehow significantly more difficult. Okay, so what does the lower bound involve? It involves somehow this event. I want to be able to say that that if I if the random walk runs for some amount of time, which is this, you know, divided by ten, then some vertex shouldn't be visited with constant probability. Okay, so I want to say that there exists a vertex which is not visited, and somehow this relationship is far too coarse to get at this. Some, I mean, there's like, you know, so somehow there are a lot of fluctuations here. The, the fact that something is zero is like a very precise kind of event. So it's, it seems far too coarse to get at this directly. So, so, so but, but, okay, so how would you do it? So if you, if you want to show that, that this, that sort of there's some value here that's zero, well, you'd like to show that, the, okay, first of all, we're, it's nice to think about the right-hand side. The right-hand side only involves a Gaussian process, so it's like easier to think about than the left-hand side that involves these local times at random times. So what you'd like to do if you want this side to be small is say that you can get for some value here, you can get the infimum of this side to be very small. In other words, you can get it so that some eta x is very close to minus square root 2t. Like very, very close. This is, this is basically how you would try to prove that some, some value here is 0. Some value here is very close to minus square root 2t. So now I'm going to tell you about a problem on Gaussian processes that's, that's the one that arises. And, and I'm, gonna, but it, I'm not going to say anything more about this connection. So one thing we do is eventually reduce the, the work of proving the lower bound on the cover time, this lower bound, to something about just purely about Gaussian processes. But some property that majorizing measures theory is not really designed to handle, so it becomes difficult. Okay. So, and here's, here's the basic idea of what we want to do. Okay, so I have a process and I have the expected maximum of this process, so it's out here somewhere. Okay, so, so you can ask, what's the size of a window around the expect? I know, I know that I should get some point. Um, I should you get some point out here, right? Because it's the expected maximum. So, and it's concentrated. So it's going to tend to be a point out near the maximum. Uh, what's, what's, what's the size of the window I can take such that I'm guaranteed to get like a point here with, say, at least probability one-tenth? 
Okay, so it turn, it's not hard to see that it turns out it's just really this, this, the, this, the sort of the, the standard deviation of these variables. So the, the size of the window I can take here is really the diameter of, of, the, of the metric space with this Euclidean distance. Okay, and, and this window is way too big to be able to say anything about a local time being zero. So somehow I want to get a, I want to be able, I want to get a smaller window. But the intuition is that, look, this, 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 pro, this is like way out near the tail. I never expected, if I just looked at this random variable, I never expected it to get out here. This is insane that there's somebody to get out here. But there's so many of them that somehow somebody managed to. So if I rewind and I look back at epsilon times the maximum, I expect that somehow in order, in order for somebody to get here, there has to be like a, 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 a trail of corpses along the way that didn't quite make it, right? I mean, somehow that, right? I mean, somehow the only way that a, a process can get so far away from its standard deviation is if a lot of people tried and failed along the way, okay? So somehow the distribution of points along the way should look like this and should be sort of like, in, you know, it should become denser and denser as we go back. But that means that I should be able to take a much smaller window around epsilon times this maximum and still be guaranteed to get a point there. If, the, if, this, if this picture is really what's going on, I should be able to take a window, a much smaller window here and get something. So, the, the problem that comes up there, and really the technical heart of the paper, is that we need estimates on the size of this, of this window as epsilon goes to zero. Okay? So we, and we, we need to get a point in this in a window with constant probability. And the, and the problem that, that sets up is that you know, majorizing measures is great at handling this first moment, this expectation. But if we want something to happen with constant probability, then we can't just talk about expectations anymore. We need to talk somehow about other moments. And so we have to do something with second moments, which this theory is not really set up to handle. Uh, because, of course, I mean, I, if I just look at the expected number of points in this window, that could be a horrible estimator. I mean, it, just, take, just take, you know, uh, one million copies of the same point. So it will rarely end up there, but when it does, there will be a million of them there. So somehow it's a very bad, so first moments do a very bad job of capturing what happens here. So now let me just tell you one slide about the, the proof. Okay, so, okay, it's going to come up in a second. So, so, so this, this process that here, uh, Oh, I didn't intend it to be that many clicks backwards. Any, 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 any Gaussian process that comes from a graph according to the resistance distances, in other words, where the covariance matrix is like the inverse of the Laplacian, is called a discrete Gaussian free field. These things are actually like very well studied. So this, this Gaussian process eta that comes out of the isomorphism theorem is a GGFF, which is a discrete Gaussian free field. Okay, so let me, uh, okay. So let me say something about the, the proof. Okay, so again, we, when we take these trees coming from majorizing measures, and what we'd like to do, now we care about second moments, right? We care about not just what is the expected maximum, we care about getting a point somewhere near the maximum or somewhere like, somewhere like you know, epsilon times the maximum. So this is, somehow it's very, it would be very natural to do some kind of percolation argument, right? Where I basically, you know, what is percolation? Every edge has some probability that, it, that it's open um, and the probabilities are independent. And the event I care about is, is there an open path from the root of the leaf? And so the reason it sort of makes sense here is because I have this tree that describes the geometry of the process. I, I, I have some event, which is that the leaf here falls into a tiny window. And I'd like to argue that sort of I, I can define this percolation so that if there's an open path, then it means that that leaf falls into the window. And then we could argue about the probability of having an open path. And the reason this is nice is because at least for, per, for percolation on, on regular trees, it's known that the first and second moments, like the second moment method work. The first moment gives you a good... Uh, estimate of what's going on for balanced trees. For unbalanced trees, it can be crazy. We don't have balanced trees, but somehow they're balanced by the majorizing measure. I mean, so some, somehow the, the optimal tree, if you think about choosing the optimal covering tree, it should be balanced because that's going to give you the, the best possible upper bound. So, so this is fine. So here, here's the problem. The problem is that sort of this Gaussian process behaves nothing like percolation in the following sense. If I, if I you know, I mean, one key fact about percolation is that if I tell you what's going on in this subtree, it doesn't say anything about what's going on here. It's all independent. I mean, that's sort of, the problem is that, you know, with, with the Gaussian process, if I tell you what's going on, you know, in this subtree, it could actually determine the value of all the random variables outside. So this is really um, annoying. And in fact, we don't know how to get over this problem in general. But we use the fact, though, that this Gaussian process is not an arbitrary process, but it's coming from this discrete Gaussian free field. And, and we know a lot about that because we know a lot about the geometry resistance metrics. And so now, by, we, by arguing about the by using sort of electrical network theory and saying, and using a structure of this resistance metric, we're able to say that somehow you can overcome this problem. So basically we reduce the problem uh, to the following case. So, so uh, some, somehow like you, you take a tree and the tree could be very bad, but then we, we, you can pass to a subtree such that 
even conditioning, say, on everything out here, there's still some large amount of entropy in here. Okay, and we don't know how to prove this for a general Gaussian process, but using the structure of the resistance metric, you, you, can, sort of, you can find some tree which controls the process and such that it has this kind of tree-like property that if I condition on everything out here, there's still some entropy in here. And then you can believe that if you try hard enough, given that condition, knowing that percolation works, you know, 10 or 15 pages later, you can say something. So, right, I mean, somehow you, you, you believe that if everything, you know, if you can set up a, a, this per, a, a, something that looks kind of like percolation, uh, and such that the event at the leaf is exactly falling in this small window, and you can get this thing to kind of behave like a tree, then if you worked hard enough, you could get this property. You could get good estimates on the probability of, of the leaf actually falling into the window. And so this is the main technical part of the proof. And, and, it, and, and here, we really use strongly the structure of, of these processes. We don't know how to prove this at all in general. This is a little bit unfortunate. OK, so uh, with that, I'm just going to state some open questions. So, so first of all, there are some open questions about, uh, uh, about this, this proof in general. For instance, this, using this isomorphism theorem is this sort of like opaque hammer that's, uh, it would be nice to get rid of it. How, yeah. how big is it? So you look at the proof of the theorem, you don't get any. The proof, is only a, the proof of the theorem is only a page of a half. So it's, it's, only, it's opaque, and it's not no, opaque in that it's sense. Like, but uh, It's all completely constructed. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you like to look at small portions of the graph. And wait, wait, which, which, which proof? The isomorphism? Like embedding into the Gaussian. Uh, uh, there's no embedding, first of all. It, there's no explicit, I mean, there, obviously there is an embedding after the fact, but the proof doesn't proceed by saying, here's the Gaussian process. The proof says, take the Gaussian process with these covariances, and now let's look at the Laplace transforms of these two distributions. But implicitly there's an embedding because of the No, I agree, but there's no, it, it's not like I can give you the process on a graph and run it and then say, you know, now generate for me from how, it, you know, like look at this local view, generate for me the Gaussian from it. That would be fantastic. No, that would be great. I believe that is what the authors of the book meant when they said they had no intuition, right? That would be amazing if you could do that. So I don't know how to do that. Really? Yeah. Uh, so let me just say that the, the upper bound basically goes through without the isomorphism theorem. So you can prove the upper bound like this, just using, using concentration and, and so forth. Uh, probably. It's not written down, but it probably, it's probably true. But the lower bound is still, I have no idea how to do it without the isomorphism theorem for exactly this reason that controlling the correlations seems really difficult. Uh, uh, another thing about the proof is that like, sort of, we, get this, we, get, we get sort of these second moment estimates for these small windows, but only for very special Gaussian processes. And it's possible that if you did a proof for more general processes, it would be much easier. So the proof is very, very technical. I mean, it's, like, it's, like, it, I mean, uh, it's not nice. And it's possible that if you, sort of, if, you have, if you found the right proof for general processes, it would be much nicer. And then there's another, th there's another question you can ask is, is sort of like, the, can you relate this to other properties of the random walk? For instance, I mean, people have studied the cover time. If you, instead of doing one walk on the graph, you run k independent walks. And then you check how the cover time evolves as you change k. So I, I don't know. It's possible that this theory could say, for instance, what happens in situations like that, too. OK, so those are the questions just about the, the approach. Let me mention sort of two questions that have been open for longer and are, 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 are kind of uh, pretty interesting. One is to show that once you have this connection between sort of cover times and Gaussian processes, you expect that you, sort of, you, could, you should be able to get certain kinds of properties. Like uh, you would expect that the cover time, I mean, or you could hope that the cover time has some kind of sub-Gaussian concentration. The only concentration known for cover times is, is, is some very, they're not, I mean, they're not weak in the sense that the only thing that's known, and the proof is quite delicate. I know AL was there for the proof. That all, were you there for that proof? Oh, okay. So I was not there for the proof. I think you were. When, <laughs> when Aldous gave the talk? No? No. Not oh, anyway. It's a very, it's... But I heard the ricochet. <laughs> anyway, so uh, it's a very clever and proof, but it, it gives something very weak. You could, hope, you could hope now, for instance, to be able to say something about get, having concentration of the cover times. And now let me mention to you the problem that sort of I find most interesting in this area at the moment. Not, not, okay, so Telegram. Uh, worked on this thing called the Bernoulli conjecture for about five years uh, without being able to solve it. And he offered $5,000 for its resolution. And he'll probably mention it, actually. I think he's giving a plenary talk at, at, uh, at Stock, so I think he'll mention it then. Uh, so we, what we said is that, if, that majorizing measures theory controls Gaussian processes. So what it, again, what it is is I take a subset of points in L2. I look at this sort of random process where these are IID Gaussians. I look at all these random variables. The majorizing measures give some way of controlling the expected uh, maximum of this process. So uh, what Talagrin asks is, what about the Bernoulli process? What if instead of Gaussians, I just use random plus minus ones? What happens there? So again, I have a family of vectors. I, I sum them up with random plus minus ones, and I look at the expected maximum. 
of this, I should have written here. This is, should be expected maximum of this, of this family of sums. Uh, and the question is, can you can control this? And the, the really beautiful thing about this question is that, I mean, this family of random variables is completely rotationally invariant. So if I rotate this set in L2, the distribution doesn't change. But of course, the distribution here depends highly on the orientation in space. If, if, the, I mean, if these vectors are very well spread out, then these sums are going to act just like by the central limit theorem. They're going to act just like sum, the sums with Gaussians. And on the other hand, if, sort of if, if these vectors are concentrated on a few coordinates, then they're going to act in a very different way. And in, fact, they, in fact, they don't have tails at all. I mean, the, you know, the maximum of n, uh, uh, like the maximum of n uh, iid plus minus one random variables is, is, is one, right? So, <laughs> so what's the 